Well, good morning. It's good to be here with all of you uh, this morning. Um, I get to fill in for my pastor more often than I get to fill in anywhere else. And uh, my pastor is exactly one foot taller than I am. And the pulpit we have was built for him. And so typically the first row has to listen by faith and not by sight. Um, so I'm glad Pastor Pat has something I can see over. And uh, yeah, so it's good to be here with you this morning. Um, I've been following some of the uh, sermons that uh, Pat's been taking you through, and he took a little detour last week. And uh, this week, we're going to kind of continue a theme that he started last week, uh, which was more or less incidental because I had already picked out my passage still. <laughs> um, if you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, as you turn there, a little bit more about myself, I was uh, more or less grew up in uh, Calvary Chapel of Valley Springs, where I'm currently an assistant pastor. Uh, I started attending when I was in junior high, and uh, I never left. My, <laughs> my pastor sometimes uh, describes me as a fixture of the fellowship, because I'm always there. Uh, and as I served, uh, when I was about, I think, 26, uh, they ordained me as an assistant pastor, and that was about 13 years ago, and I've been serving there ever since, and it's been a blessing to uh, assist my pastor there. Uh, but part of that training uh, did take place with Pastor Pat and uh, his equipping there. And so uh, it's a blessing to, in some ways, return uh, the favor, uh, to let him partake of some of the fruit of his own uh, ministry. And uh, some of that will be important for our um, teaching this morning. Uh, so if you would stand with me as we read through the scriptures together, we're going to be in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, the last part of chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word and conduct and love and spirit in faith, in purity, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands and of the eldership. Meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing so, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, uh, which is uh, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, it shows us where we're at uh, and uh, where we need to go. Lord, we ask that you would uh, open your word to us this morning. Lord, that you would uh, soften our hearts and sharpen our minds. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> uh, I was ordained when I was 26, which would make me a, a fairly young pastor. And uh, one of the first times I filled in for my pastor, when my pastor wasn't there, because my pastor was there for the first couple of times, uh, he was test flighting me. Uh, so he was, you know, front row taking notes, which is, you know, different uh, for a young man. Uh, but there was actually one service when I was about 27 years old where uh, the regular worship team wasn't there, but the uh, the college group worship team, because I was the college uh, pastor at that time, uh, was there. And so the whole service was ran by people uh, like between 25 and 26 or 7, however old I was. <laughs> and uh, our congregation at my fellowship is, is a pretty diverse uh, congregation. Uh, my pastor uh, is just about 70, and uh, there's everybody in that age group all the way down to we've got a young family in our fellowship with nine kids uh, and our children's ministry is about 40 kids strong. And so we've got a whole spectrum of people uh, age-wise in our church. And I find, and I found myself at times being a young pastor uh, to people who could be my parents. Uh, I remember the very first Bible study I ever taught. I was 14. <laughs> and I say taught with air quotes. And Pastor Pat, this is for you. Uh, he'll know what this means. Uh, if you're curious, ask Pastor Pat about Austin and air quotes. He'll, he'll explain. Um, I was 14 years old. I was going to the men's morning prayer and Bible study. We'd have prayer at like six o'clock in the morning to seven and then uh, Bible study from seven to eight. And then I would get a ride to junior high school. So, <laughs> uh, and we were going through Psalm 119 
uh, eight verses at a time. If you're familiar with the psalm, it's the longest psalm in scripture, and it is in eight verse chunks. And so my pastor caught the first eight verses, and he said, who would like to teach the next eight verses? And so I said, I do. And so like the next week, I taught <laughs> the next eight verses um, to my pastor, to my youth pastor, to my dad, and some other kids that was a friend of mine, his dad. They were all more qualified uh, than I was to teach the passage. And yet my pastor gave me the opportunity to teach the passage. And uh, it was the easiest Bible study I ever taught. And here's why. You might think that would be intimidating to teach that group of people. Uh, it was the safest Bible study I ever taught. And it was because uh, if I said anything wrong, all of them felt more than qualified and comfortable correcting me on the spot <laughs> and in real time. So it's like, you know, walking a tightrope, but with a really big safety net and a bungee cord and a tie off and all the other, you know, safety things. I'm more concerned now uh, as a pastor um, in my church right now, I'm serving in the children's ministry and I, I teach littles. And the thing about littles when you teach them is everything that you tell them, they're going to believe you. And to me, that's way more dangerous than teaching a pastor who you can't pull the wool over his eyes because he knows. Um, and so there's, there's, there was a lot of security in that very first study that I taught. And it was the very first time I walked out in a gifting that God was giving, had given to me. It was a, a discovery process. Um, it was uh, the fruit of what God had done, um, but it was a gift that was going to be discovered and then over the process of time developed, and then today deployed. And so we're going to see how that works out in Timothy's life as well. Because Timothy uh, was a protege of Paul, the apostle. And Paul's the one writing this letter right now. If you've ever wondered what pastors talk about when like, they get together, uh, just read First and Second Timothy and Titus. There's, these are their text messages back and forth to each other. So if you want to know what pastors talk about, these are the kinds of things pastors talk about. Um, one of my favorite phrases to remind people of is the fact that pastors are people too. And what I mean by that is uh, we need as pastors what everybody else needs. Um, and in some ways, we don't get it as often. Whereas uh, pastors are always exhorting and encouraging and you know rebuking or whatever they need to do for the congregation to be healthy and safe, uh, pastors need the same. Uh, if you read through uh First and Second Timothy and Titus, you'll see encouragement, you'll see exhortation, you'll see rebuke. Uh, everything that every believer needs, uh, your pastor also needs. And that's what uh, Paul is doing with Timothy in writing this letter to him. He had trained him, he had sent him out, and now he's encouraging him and giving him specific instructions in what he's supposed to do in order to pastor the church that he's at well. So specifically, this sermon is for pastors, but there are our applications for each one of us. And we're going to see why that's the case, even though it's a letter to pastors, why that's important for everyone, even if you're not a pastor. Uh, notice there in verse 12 and 16, he says, uh, in effect, that Timothy, your life is a lesson. Your service to the Lord is serving others. Uh, notice what he says there again in verse 12. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers. And uh, in Timothy's culture, uh, his youth would be about, I'd be the top end of youth. Um, I know I, I probably look younger than I am. I've just celebrated my uh, last 30th-ish birthday. Uh, my next one is going to be somewhere over a hill, um, <laughs> from what I'm told. Uh, and uh, for Timothy, in his culture and his time, uh, a youth would be considered anybody from their mid-20s all the way to their late 30s. And to uh, do the work that a pastor needed to do, it would be difficult uh, to do that work sometimes if you were younger than the people you needed to exhort or rebuke or teach. And uh, so Paul tells Timothy here, don't let anyone despise your youth. And what he's saying there is not go around telling people, don't despise my youth, don't despise my youth. Uh, he's saying, let your age not be despicable. <laughs> and, and how you live. <laughs> he says, rather, in the contrast, and this is how we get that clarity, is be an example to the believers. If you've been in any kind of leadership, you understand the, the power of an example in, in your role as leaders. And so uh, leadership can be uh, a parent, you can be a teacher in Sunday school, you can be a pastor, um, but there's unspoken rules about what your example is doing. Um, you're teaching without saying anything. How you live is setting a standard. 
Uh, I learned this lesson the very hard way <laughs> on a mission trip I was on. Going to, uh, we got on a, a retired city bus going up uh, the coast all the way up to Portland, Oregon. We'd get off the bus, do some street dramas, witness to people. And uh, this one kid uh, did some bad things and was about to get kicked out <laughs> the uh, the mission trip. And so I volunteered myself to be his traveling buddy so that I would be directly responsible for his behavior and, you know, his good behavior and direct him in the right way. And so uh, I, I was only like 14 or 15 at the time. And he was about the same age as I was, I think, maybe just a few years younger. And uh, I did this one thing while we were getting off the bus that I used to do on the school bus all the time when I went to a public school. Uh, is you would, the person standing in front of you would have their backpack on and you would pick it up and you'd say, you're flying, you're flying, you're flying. And then you'd say, you're crashing down and you pull it down. They're like, ah, <laughs> and they just like fall down to the ground. And it's fun and it's funny uh, if the person you're doing it with is okay with it. And so what I did with discernment and choosing people who I know would be okay with it, he did with a lack of discernment. And what I discovered about leadership is that uh, your, your option as a leader isn't if you want to be an example or not. Your option as a leader is what kind of example are you going to be? Because he followed my example, <laughs> but without the uh, wherewithal of who and when to do that with. And so I had set a bad example and he followed it. So if you're a parent or you're a pastor or a Sunday school teacher, an older brother, uh, somebody's looking at your life and learning the lesson of it. And how you're living is teaching them. I learned how to repent from my dad. Not because he sat me down and taught me a Bible study lesson on repentance, although he was a Sunday school teacher of mine, so maybe he did. But I learned how to repent because my dad repented. <laughs> like, here's how you handle the sin in your own life. You say, hey, I sinned. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? <laughs> right? I handled the sin in my life as a youth, just like my father handled the sin in his life. I made right choices because he made right choices. I tried to learn from his mistakes, but oftentimes, I'm not sure about you, uh, <laughs> I, I had to relearn some of those <laughs> lessons that he made. Um, but here's the deal. Pastors are supposed to be good examples to the believers they shepherd. And as true as that is for them, that's going to be true for us because they're the example. They're the example of what a good example is. And that can be overwhelming at times, the weight of that responsibility. And uh, I, I want to clarify how we can do that well. Um, because we are examples of primarily, Lord willing, <laughs> righteousness, making the right choice at the right time, having the right attitude, giving the right advice, not saying the wrong thing, listening when we should, all of those good things were examples of righteousness, Lord willing. Um, but I know uh, that what the scripture says of me is also true of you, that we all stumble in many things. Uh, James chapter 3, verse 2, it's, a, it's one sentence. It has a period at the end when it says we all stumble in many things. It's not a comma and then like accept <laughs> and then your name or your pastor's name, <laughs> right? It's, it's a period which means it's the end of the thought. <laughs> we all stumble in many things. So what do we do when we don't model righteousness, when the example we set isn't right? It's what my dad did. When you don't model righteousness, you have the opportunity to model repentance. And if there's something this world needs a really good model of, it's repentance. If there's something your kids need a really good model of, it's repentance. If I make excuses for my sins and say, well, it's this, it's because of that and because of this, I shouldn't be surprised if my kids, they do the same. But if I own it, if I repent of it, if I'm like, hey, God said to do this and I didn't do that. If God said, uh, and, and I fell short of that, I promised you we would and we didn't. I didn't follow through. God says we, we should be men of our word, our yes being yes. And I'm sorry, I, I didn't do that. That was not pleasing to God and that was hurtful to you. Will you forgive me? I'm teaching my kids how to repent by the example that I'm setting because of the life that I live. And what Paul is telling Timothy is you will have opportunities to teach with words before the congregation, and those will be good things. He's going to tell them to do that here in a few verses, but the very the, the strongest <laughs> message he's going to be uh, share is the one that he lives with his life. Uh, there's a story of a pastor who was super eloquent in the pulpit, and his life just did not measure up. And they said that he was such a wonderful speaker. He could articulate God's word so well, but he had such a terrible attitude. He treated everybody so poorly out of the pulpit that they never wanted him to leave the pulpit. 
And God forbid that it should be that for us, that we would know God's standard without living God's standard, uh, that the message of our life, that it would be consistent with the message of God's word. And so that's the very first exhortation he says, and he, he gives this long list of things in word, in conduct, uh, in, uh, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Uh, and verse 16, it kind of echoes the same thing. So in this passage, it's, it's a passage that is framed in thoughts, and it gets closer, and in the center of it will be our last point, which is the, the, the title of our message. Um, it, it's going to be the, the central thought. And so we're going to see the frame first, and this frame is your life is a lesson, and we see that at the very end of our section in verse 16. And so if you look down at verse 16, you, you'll see that he's basically saying the same thing again, but he says it in a different way. He says, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, for con uh, continue in them, for, and this is where it connects, in doing this, you will save both yourselves, yourself and those who hear you. That means the way you live your life is not unconnected from the way they're going to live their life. That the message you're teaching is going to directly impact them, and that message is not just the words you speak, but the life that you live. He's saying that the power of your example is eternal and affects the soul. And so that's the frame of this picture, if you would. He's going to zoom in a little bit, and we're going to see the foreground of everything uh, in his next point, where he says that um, the, the general call on your life, your general life that you're living it is going to uh, accentuate that. And then lastly, it's going to be the gifts that you have and how you handle that. That's kind of the central focus of this passage. And so uh, verses uh, verse 13 and 16a are the next inner frame of verses. So notice in that section, he says, do the work that you've been called to do. So one pastor telling another pastor, do the work that you're called to do. Notice what he says there in verse 13, till I come... Give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Uh, and then verse 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. He's like saying the same thing twice again. Um, but what he's telling him to do is to do the work that he's been called to do. Uh, if you have teenagers, perhaps if you are a teenager, you've heard this. <laughs> uh, your parents have asked you to do something, and then like 10 minutes later, they somehow want you to still do that thing that you haven't done yet, <laughs> and they have to tell you again. Um, God's given each one of us, a, a, has a call on each one of our lives, and for a pastor, the specific work is described there in verse 13. So if you want to know, generally speaking, what the public ministry of a path, pastor's life is, specifically like on a Sunday morning for our context, it's what is described there in verse 13. He says, give attention to reading. In uh, the original Greek, it, it has a definite article in there, which just means uh, to the reading, and that's the public reading of scripture. Um, that's where you get up in front of people and you read the scriptures. This is what was common in the Jewish culture of their day, all the way back to the time of Nehemiah when they were rebuilding the wall. Uh, perhaps if you're familiar with that passage where they'd finished building the wall, they got off the Bible, and they had a, a one-day-long Bible study, and he taught the word plainly, and gave the sense of it. So he would read it and explain it. <laughs> and that's what Timothy's supposed to do. That's what pastors are supposed to do. That's what Calvary Chapel is known for in general, is we just read the word and tell you what it means, and we move on. <laughs> right? There's, we're not trying to give you, I, I don't have anything for you this morning except for what God has in his word. And that's, that's the case, always. And that's what we should desire from a pastor. And so Timothy is instructed by Paul and even authorized by Paul. So Timothy would have this letter and he's like, look, Paul said, till I come, <laughs> I'm supposed to do this work. <laughs> I'm supposed to stand up with the scriptures and read them. I'm supposed to, from those scriptures, uh, exhort you or tell you what you're supposed to do with them. And I'm supposed to teach you from those scriptures the things that are right. That's the doctrine, what is right and what is wrong and how you're supposed to live in light of that. And so He's supposed to give attention to those things. Um, I mentioned it in my prayer this morning, but Psalm 119, verse 105 is one of my favorite verses uh, for the children's ministry class, but it's also one of my favorite verses just for me. Uh, it's a prayer I pray for myself often. And it's when I'm coming in contact with God's word because it describes what God's word is like. Psalm 119, verse 105, it says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you're in the dark uh, and you don't know where to go, 
if you can see where you are, that's a lamp unto your pe uh, feet and a light unto your path that's showing you where th the next step. Uh, I drove here last night from uh, where I live, so it was a couple hours away, and it was dark, and so I had my headlights on. <laughs> uh, my headlights did not light up the entire way from my house to Half Moon Bay when I turned them on. They just lit up right in front of me. That's all I really needed to see. <laughs> and God's Word does the same for us in our life. It shows us the reality of where we're at, not just in relationship to Him, but in relationship to the things of this world, to our, the work that we have, the, the, the kids that God has given us to raise, uh, the jobs that we have to do. It shows us where we're at, and then it also shows us where we need to go next. Um, sometimes we want step 15, and we really haven't considered <coughs> being obedient to step one. <laughs> God's word gives us light to step one, and uh, that's sometimes hard enough for me. I, I won't speak for you, but just one step at a time is is what I need in my obedience, and God's word provides that for us. When we live our life in light of God's word, we will know where we are. We will know where we need to go next, because God's word is a lamp and a light shows us where we're at and where we're going. And in regard to that, the first part of verse 16, uh, Timothy is exhorted by Paul to take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Uh, taking heed uh, is not a phrase that we use often. Um, and when I'm explaining it to the kids, uh, my, my own kids or the kids in my Sunday school class who I normally teach, uh, heeding is different than hearing. Uh, you can hear something and not heed it. Like, did you hear me to? Did you hear me when I asked you to, you know, put your clothes in the hamper? Yep. Why didn't you do it? Because I didn't heed it. Heed. I, how I how I explain it to the kids is hearing and doing. And you you combine those words, hearing and doing. You're heeding. You've heard and you put it into action. And he's saying to take heed uh, to yourself and to the doctrine. And what he's saying is examine yourself carefully. And examine the scriptures carefully. And a pastor or parent or leader of any kind who is not examining themselves in the light of scripture, continually taking heed to where they're at in re relationship to scripture, is going to be far from where they need to be. The, uh, the Pharisees of Jesus' day, Jesus actually commended in one way. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I was in my morning reading this morning, so I didn't put it in my notes. But as I was, was the first couple of verses in my morning reading, I think it was in Matthew chapter 23, uh, Jesus warned his disciples saying, you know, listen to the Pharisees, but don't do what they do because they don't follow what they're saying. <laughs> They've got good doctrine, but their their practice is not good. Uh, and there was a phrase thrown around when I was growing up, not in my house, but a phrase I heard, uh, do as I say, not as I do. And uh, that's a terrible phrase for a Christian. We call that hypocrisy. Um, it would almost be better to not say anything at all. And there's a, a, a quote uh, that goes something along of, of the lines of, uh, I can't quite hear what you're saying because your actions are speaking so loudly. And so it will be hard for anyone to hear us if what we're saying isn't, if we hadn't taken heed to ourselves. And it will be hard for somebody to hear us who knows the word if we haven't taken heed to ourselves according to the scriptures, according to the doctrine. So what he's saying is, you know, preach the word, but also live the word. Take it seriously. And it's more, I would say that the, the separation is the public work of a pastor uh, is in the public reading and the exhortating and the declaring the truths of scripture, but the private work precedes the public work. Uh, I... I knew that God had called me to be a pastor when I was about 14, but I was not ready to be a pastor at 14. <laughs> the call to me was clear. The gifting uh, was uh, buried and hidden. Um, when I was in school, uh, I mentioned earlier that I was 14 and in junior high. Uh, I got held back a couple years um, because I couldn't read, and apparently that's a requirement. Um, so <laughs> I struggled with reading for a long time and then finally figured out how to do it moderately well or good enough to where I can read in my classes, and I'm still a terrible at reading. Uh, and then God's call on my life is to read in public. 
because God has a sense of humor. <laughs> I don't I don't know. <laughs> he wants to encourage you with me. <laughs> That's what the deal is. Um, and so uh, the Lord sometimes uh, calls us to things that we aren't naturally gifted in. And uh, but the, but the work that is public is always preceded by the work that is private. Uh, your uh, your outreach will only ever be as effective as your upreach, as one pastor has put it. Um, I don't have anything to give to you other than what the Lord has. So if I don't go to the Lord, I have nothing to give. But you know what the Lord has? Everything. <laughs> I was explaining to this uh, my my kids at my church on our Wednesday night service, um, trying to explain the love of God and how it works in us receiving it and the opportunity we have to give it. And so I'm going to give you that same illustration because it's a fun, silly illustration and it's I just really like it. It's. I told them it would be like if I gave you a magic box of donuts that every time you closed it, it refilled. And I was like, okay, you can have, you close it, you open it up, you give all your friends some donuts, you have some donuts yourself, you close it again, you open it up, there's more donuts. I'm like, if you didn't have any donuts and your friends didn't have any donuts, what excuse would you have? I was like, well, I don't know how the donut box, you know, the magic donut box works, but like if you did have it and you did know how it works, would anybody ever lack donuts around you? No, because... The, the resource is infinite. You'd be the coolest person on Sunday morning every morning. It's like, infinite donut guy. Like, here you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting the love handles on the body of Christ. Right? It would be, it, it's an infinite amount. It's just, there's no end to it. You could, do, but if, if you claim to have that, but were stingy in how you gave it out, were careful and, and selective of when you had your own because you didn't want to run out, you might claim you have an infinite box of donuts, but I wouldn't believe you. I would believe you when you started giving more than you could possibly ever give yourself, right? And in relationship to receiving God's love, it's infinite. In relationship to expressing God's love, it's got the same limitation, which is none. And the only way the world's going to believe that that's true is when we start giving more than we could possibly ever have on our own. When what's required of us is more than what we can give. I remember when God first made it clear to me that he was calling me to be a pastor and to publicly read in scripture. I, I, I got saved when I was 12. My dad called me into his room. Do you know you're a sinner? I'm looking at my dad. I'm like the one person who knows. <laughs> Can't lie to him, <laughs> right? <laughs> Walks me down the Roman road. I, I give the Lord my sins when I'm 12, but it wasn't until I was 14 that I gave him my life. And what I mean by that is I still wanted to do what I wanted to do. And then when I was 14, I realized I don't want to do what I've been doing living for myself as a, as a Christian. And I was like, Lord, I wasn't really suicidal, but I didn't want to live anymore. I'm, I'm not sure if you've been there or understand what I'm saying. I just don't want to live for me anymore. I was like, Lord, if you have a plan for my life, let's do that. And I was like, Lord, here's everything I have right here. Whatever you want within what I have, you can have. Do whatever you want with. And God answered that surrender to life with, great, this is what I want you to do. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is what I have. He's like, but we're doing this. I'm like, but how? This is what I have. <laughs> because my limitations aren't limiting God's work. And then when I do this, even though I am this, the people that know me best understand that the margins that have been accomplished, they're like, I know Austin. He can't do that. He's an idiot. But look it. <laughs> there must be a God. I become my own apologetic argument <laughs> for the existence of God because of the things that God is doing in me and accomplishing through me. I can't do what God has called me to do apart from him. And the call of God on your life is going to be no less different. God's going to ask you to do things that you cannot do because he didn't make you to be independent of him. He made you to be dependent on him. And that's not a result of the fall. That has always been the case. If you go back, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, there's no sin in the world. And you know what? in this perfect world that God has? There's three things actually in this perfect world that God made that wouldn't be in my perfect world because I'm an American. <laughs> Perhaps they're different for you as well. There's three things that you'll see in scripture if you look at the perfect world that God made. The first thing is that there's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There is temptation in God's perfect world. In my perfect world, there is zero temptation. All the temptations far away, but God put it there as an opportunity for them to express their love to him. By saying no to this, I'm saying yes to you. 
If my wife was the only one, last woman on earth, and I married her, she might question, does he really love me? <laughs> right? I'm the only one here. <laughs> he had no choice. But if there's all of these other single ladies in the world and I chose her above all of them, then my love for her is, is validated by that choice. But So God's perfect world, there's an opportunity to sin. God's perfect world, not only is there an opportunity to sin, but there's work. He gave Adam a job to tend and to keep. In my perfect world, I'm retired. <laughs> my job is sitting in a hammock somewhere. But that's not God's intention. In God's perfect world, he made us to work and to serve him. And so work has been cursed, yes, but work wasn't always cursed. He made us to serve him. And the last, and that this is the point coming back around, God made Adam with a need that only he could satisfy. Do you remember that story? God made Adam and he was alone and God looked at him and he's like, it's not good. <laughs> right? I, I was single in my church for many years. Um, I, I, was, I met my wife uh, at the college Bible study that I was teaching and uh, we dated uh, my, on our, my first date when I was 30. So I was single. I didn't date at all. I decided I wasn't going to date until I knew it would lead to marriage or, and I was junior high when I made that choice. So I didn't date at all. And then there was just nobody in Valley Springs. <laughs> and then, then the Lord brought her to me and, um, you know, God did the same for, for Adam. He looked at Adam and he's like, it's not good for him to be alone. All the, all the ladies in my church were like, it's not good for Austin to be alone. We, we need to pray for him to have a wife. And they prayed for many years. <laughs> God answered that prayer. And God looked at Adam, but the very first thing God does, doesn't he doesn't provide Adam a wife uh, first. The next thing is kind of random. He tells Adam to name all the animals. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Hippopotamus, Mr. and Mrs. Kangaroo, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Bee. And Adam's going like this, one, two, one, two, one, two. Wait a minute. <laughs> There isn't a helper comparable to me. He realized, Adam realized, God, God put Adam in a space to where he would realize he had a need that he couldn't satisfy himself. God made Adam with a need in the perfect world. The perfect world with the perfect man had needs that only God could satisfy. And then God gave him the command to take a nap. It's as passive, that's closest to death that we come while still being alive. He's not doing anything at all. And God provides him that need makes Eve, wakes him up, and he's like, whoa, man, oh, woman. <laughs> In our relationship with the Lord, that's still the case. God has made us to need him in order to serve him in, in a way that's honoring and pleasing to him. And so Timothy's exhorted, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Make sure your upreach is first so that your outreach can be effective. Lastly, he tells Timothy, uh, verses 14 through 15, to not neglect the gift that is in you. Do not neglect the gift in you. Notice there, verse 14 again, it says, Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy in the laying on uh, of hands of the eldership, Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. And so the first sub-point here is uh, from, from Paul to Timothy is you have a gift. Um, but that's not just true for Timothy. I know sometimes we can look at pastors and be like, wow, I can never do that. I was just talking with uh, the guy who runs our sound system at our church yesterday. And we were at a barbecue together and we were reminiscing on a, a time uh, when I was about 20, and we were setting up church in a box, and um, it was just my pastor, the sound guy, and myself, and I was setting up chairs, and my pastor came in that morning with kind of a sore throat. He was sucking on a cough drop, and he's like, yeah, maybe one of these mornings if I was sick, I, one of you guys can teach. And he was like, immediately, no. And I was immediately like, yes. <laughs> and and it wasn't because I was ready for it yet, or that this other gentleman didn't want to. It's just there was no, there, there was calling associated with me. There was no calling associated with him. But they say that one of uh, the top fears is public speaking and that death is after that, <laughs> which means some people would rather die <laughs> than do what I'm doing right now. <laughs> and um, so sometimes we look at people who are doing things that we would rather die than do. Um, and we're like, ah, they're so gifted. I could never do that. I don't have any gifts. 
and, and but that's not true. You have different gifts. You may not have that gift, which is fine. Um, actually, side note, uh, for a season, uh, I was in uh, helping lead the youth, and I was leading in worship. And I did it for about six years as a junior high youth pastor, helping lead the, the youth in worship. And I, I never got good at it. <laughs> the first time I came and I was helping the youth pastor, um, they were singing a cappella, and some youth groups can do that. Some youth groups are cool being a cappella youth groups. Our youth group was not. <laughs> and so after the service, I told the youth pastor, hey, I think I know how to play some of those songs. He's like, great, bring your guitar next week. It's like, why did I say anything? <laughs> and for six years, I led them in worship. And it wasn't according to a gift. It was according to a willingness. My ability was availability. That's what my ability was. But it was associated with a calling for that season. And what I mean by that is this. The last set of worship I led, after six years of leading these kids in worship, we stopped halfway through one of the songs and just started over because I, I didn't know where I was at. <laughs> it was way off key. It was just not good. I, I feel like I sing in such a way in order to encourage others to sing louder. That's, that's my motivation. That's how I lead. I lead from the back end. Like, Let's try them out. Um, we have an awesome worship team at my church. My, my senior pastor is very gifted. He leads our worship team. And our youth group would sometimes be in there and none of them would sing. And then we'd do youth group and they would all sing. And I'm like, God, I don't understand. How come they don't follow an awesome worship leader? And why are they following me? It doesn't make any sense. And what he explained to me in that moment is, I've called you to do this. And calling is more important than gifting. And sometimes we can feel inadequate when we compare ourselves among ourselves. But Jesus says that is unwise. So we look at another parent and like, I'm inadequate compared to them. We look at another coworker. I'm inadequate compared to them. Or I look at somebody else who has gifting in an area that I'm called to that I don't have. My brother, okay, so my brother, I have an older brother, and I look up to him not just because he's taller, but and not just because he's older, but like he's he's got the opposite gifts of me in a variety of ways. When I was in fourth grade, I could not read. My brother in fourth grade got in trouble for reading when he shouldn't be in class because he was bored of listening to the teacher. <laughs> he's very gifted in that way, and I'm like, God, why can't I have his gifts? And he's like, look, when I called you and gifted you, I, I knew what I was doing. I gave you what I gave you, and I'm not dissatisfied with the gifts that I gave you. Are you dissatisfied with the gifts that God's given you? I was for a time. And I want to encourage you that this might be the one verse that you take away, but it's 1 Peter 4.10. It says in 1 Peter 4.10, As each one of you has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold, grace of God. But it's the first part of that verse that I want to point out is each one of you have received a gift. We all have at least one gift. And it was given to us, but it wasn't given for us. It was given to us for the service of the body of Christ. Sometimes we can have this misconception about what the role of the pastor is. The role of the pastor is to have all the gifts and do all of the work. That's not the gift. That's not the call of the pastor. Um, you would not want me to do all of the work because God hasn't called me to do it. God hasn't called me to be the, parents, the parent of your kid or to be the witness in the place of work that you're at or to be the witness in your family when you go to family reunions and Christmases and God called you to do that work. He didn't call anybody else. He called you. Sometimes I compare myself with other teaching pastors and I'm like, man, I wish I had their gift, <laughs> right? And I, I wish I could do what they could do. And that's okay to an extent, but the, the role of a, of a pastor is explained in uh, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, it says, uh, And he, speaking of God, gave some to be apostles, prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So let me explain that or unpack that for a minute. Pastors are given to the church so that the saints... Those are everybody not on the stage right now. <laughs> if you're a believer, that's you, to be equipped for the work of the ministry. So if you're really wooden in how you in interpret that, it means that the only people doing ministry are you, <laughs> not me. <laughs> it's my job to equip you to do the work of the ministry. <clears throat> Timothy is being exhorted by Paul to not neglect the gift that is in him because he's an example to the believers because they have gifts too. Jesus told uh, a parable about uh, some stewards that were given uh, different uh, gifts, if you would, talents, uh, which was a measurement of money 
but you can even think of it talents as abilities or giftings. And each of them had a different gift. One had, a, you know, one talent, one had five talents, and one had uh, three talents or something like that. And the first two, they doubled it. And he said to them, well done, good and faithful servants, enter into the joy of the Lord. But to the one who had one, he's like, I know you, and you're a terrible guy. So I took your money and I buried it. <laughs> he hid it. Jesus said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You should have at least put it in the bank. <laughs> there, there could have been interest built off of that. You could have at least gotten a secular job and used the gift that I gave you. <laughs> and it would have been at least a little bit useful there. But God has given each of us a gift over which we are stewards. We have the opportunity to um, discover it, develop it, and deploy it. And that's, that's the heart of every pastor. The heart of every pastor, as they look out, they're looking for gifts to discover, to develop, because my, my gift to, to, to teach would not have been guessed when I was in fourth grade. Like, here's a kid who cannot read. How could he possibly study anything? <laughs> Probably not a pastor. <laughs> Maybe a janitor. He'd be good for cleaning toilets. He's <laughs> <It's> fine, right? <laughs> um, but uh, I don't want to disparage the work of a janitor. I was a janitor for a year at Lowe's. It was one of my favorite jobs um, because it's one of the, those jobs that uh, if you do well, nobody notices your work. And if you do it, Poorly, everybody will let you know. <laughs> it's a job with a lot of accountability is what I'm saying. It's only when you go above and beyond where they're like, wow, I'm not sure if this has ever happened to you where you've gone into a bathroom and you were impressed by how clean it was. Like, that was my goal as a janitor. It's like, I wanted to serve the Lord in the, in the place of Lowe's <laughs> that people would look at the work that I did and glorify God, right? And that's what my pastor was training me to do. And so Timothy had a gift, you have a gift, we, we all have gifts. It's the job of a pastor to help discover, develop, and deploy that gift. So if, if you're here and you've never heard that before, uh, Pat is going to be looking at you as a gifted person whose gift may be in seed form, but it might be an oak tree one day. It, it took many years for my gift to develop in the way that it did, uh, and oftentimes that's the case. But God is the giver of that gift. Paul didn't like go to the spiritual gift store and pick it out for him, or Timothy didn't choose it for himself. God is the chooser of the gift. God is the giver of the gift. Uh, historically, this happened in uh, Timothy's life when it was the laying on the hand of the eldership. Um, but the, the phrase that's there uh, says, uh, which was given to you by prophecy, that word forgiven could also be translated granted. Some Bibles translate it that way as granted to you. It'd be like they were praying that God would give him the gift of being a pastor. And God answered that prayer. And now he needs to respond to that gift that's been given. So God is, we each have a gift. God is the giver of that gift. And our response to that gift is to give ourselves to it. What God desires from us is that we would give ourselves to the gift that he has given to us. Notice again how verse 14 starts. He says, do not neglect the gift. I tried looking up the word uh, neglect on Google just to get a, a definition. And the first thing to pop up was all of these, you know, child services, <laughs> child neglect, and uh, kids who aren't cared for in the way they ought to be. And that, that I eventually found the, the dictionary definition of neglect, but it, it sim simply means this, to fail to care for properly. Timothy, do not neglect. Don't fail to care for properly the gift that God has given you. Well, how do, we, how do we do that? How do we not neglect the gift? He tells us uh, two ways, uh, in our mind and in our actions. Uh, the next verse, verse 15, he says to meditate on these things. What does he mean by meditate? Uh, it's not the Eastern definition of meditation, which is typically emptying your mind of all things and like zoning out or whatever it is, but it's to fill your mind with something, to think on these things. Uh, in the same way that right now my kids have been counting down the days till Christmas, <laughs> they, they meditate on it day and night. <laughs> the gifts that they might get <laughs> for Christmas, right? They think about it all the time. I don't have to tell my kids, hey, start thinking about Christmas, <laughs> because they already do. They meditate on it. They think about it all the time. They fill their mind with and they think on Christmas. When he says these things, what things is he referring to? Well, he's referring to at least two or three things. 
the gift that God has given to him for sure. Think about the gift that God's given to you. Think about the giver of that gift. Think about the one who gave it to you. And think about when that gift was discovered. That's what Paul was reminding him of. Remember, think about the time that we prayed to God and God gave you that gift. Think about that historical moment when you realized, I, I was on that mission trip. Remember the mission trip I told you about with the backpack? I was on that mission trip. Our bus, our bus broke down in Reading. It was like 110 degrees outside and we broke down right next to a park. This is when I discovered that God had called me to be a preacher and pastor. It broke down the, the rest area that was right next to us randomly had all of these park benches and whatever, but it had a podium. And I just walked up to it and I did the Pastor Chuck and just grabbed it. And I had the strongest desire in my heart to teach the kids there. I had nothing to give to them at that moment, but I was just like, I really want to teach them right now. That's a weird desire. <laughs> Most people would rather die. But God put that in my heart when I was 14. That's when I discovered the seed. It wasn't long after that that I taught that first Bible study. It was a few years after that that Pastor Pat saw me in his school. It was a few years after that that my pastor ordained me as a pastor. It was developing. It was planted. It was watered. It was going to bear fruit eventually, but it was a, a seed. Think about what God has called you to. If you're a husband, your calling is clear. Love your wife. If you're a wife, your calling is clear. Submit to your husband. If you're a kid, your calling is clear. Honor your father and mother. If you have a job and you have a boss, your calling is clear. Work as unto the Lord. There are many callings we can have and uh, balance out between each other, but God has called us and gifted us with specific gifts in order to fulfill our calling. So the first thing we do to not neglect the gift is to think on it. Think of the one who gave it to us. Think of the time we discovered it. Lastly, he says, give yourself entirely to them. I know you know what it's like to give yourself entirely to it because Peter describes what it was like before we got saved and how we are now. Peter, in 1 Peter 4, verses 2 through 4, he says uh, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh, for the flesh, uh, for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in the lewdness of lust and drunkenness and revelries, drinking parties and abominable idolatries, in regard to these things, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. And so when you get saved and your life is not what it once was and everybody's like, hey, why don't you want to do all these things? The way it describes it is running with them. They are 100% in on sending their brains out. <laughs> they have given themselves entirely to it. And before I gave my life to the Lord, I was giving myself entirely to something else. And then I chose to give, give my entire life to him. And what that expressed itself in is by giving myself entirely to the gift. It's interesting that word there for forgive is not, in giving yourself to the gift, that, that word forgive, it's not the normal word forgive. It's a word that's normally translated uh, to be. Like it's who you are. Like it be that thing. <laughs> like that kind of, like where people can't identify you as something diff different or other than, oh yeah, that's him. He always is serving as under the Lord. He'll work hard even if nobody's watching when he's at work because he thinks God's watching him. But if you watch him, you can tell he thinks that God's watching him, <laughs> right? Give yourself entirely to the gift. We used to give ourselves entirely to lesser things. And then sometimes what happens I'll speak for myself. It happened to me for a few years. I gave myself moderately to the things that the Lord had called me to because I wanted to be reasonable about my obedience. Even though in all my disobedience, I was very unreasonable. I would stay up late. I'd get up early. I'd make poor choices. All unreasonable things so that I could do what I wanted. But when I do what the Lord wants, well, I need to be reasonable about it. Am I going to get enough sleep if I'm going to be obedient to the Lord in that? Jesus stayed up late casting out demons and got up early and started praying the next day. There were some days because out of obedience, he was tired to the Lord. <laughs> Have you given yourself entirely to the gift that God has given you? Are you becoming what he wants you to become? We're going to wrap it up here. Uh, Pat said I needed to be done about nine minutes ago. Sorry. 
Um, but I don't want us to leave here without having some pointed application for us. So if you're if you're a new believer, if you're just joining us in the body of Christ, know that God has given to you gifts. They're from him and they're for you. And he's not ashamed of who you are. And he doesn't wish you had other gifts than the ones he gave you. Discover them. He wants you to. Pastor Pat would love to help you discover those gifts too. Sometimes I, I, I have this general rule. If, if God has called you to do something and you're not sure, try not doing it for a season and see how that goes. Also read the book of Jonah. <laughs> God has a way of making us willing <laughs> to do the things he's called us to. But God has a gift for you. He's given it to you. Don't neglect it. Discover it. Develop it. Deploy it. If you're a mature believer, if you could have said everything I said, but said it better with like life experience, because you're not a youth <laughs> such as myself, you know that you have a gift. But my question to you is, have you taken heed to that gift? Are you doing anything with it? The danger, the, the, the hard part about being a mature believer is different than the hard part about being a, a young believer. A young believer, it's difficult because you just don't know what God wants you to do in a given situation. And that's appropriate if you're young. Don't feel bad about that. Grow, but when you become a mature believer, the difficulty is no longer knowing what God wants you to do. The difficulty is doing it. <laughs> God, I really know you want me to forgive this person right now, but I kind of want to just hold a grudge. <laughs> God, I know you really want me to work as unto you, but my boss, he's a jerk. <laughs> God, I know you want me to love my wife self-sacrificially, but she doesn't respect me. Obedience is, is what God's after. Heeding the gift that he's given to you is what he desires. If you wouldn't identify as a new believer or a mature believer, perhaps you're here somehow, by God's grace, and you wouldn't say that you are a believer. You wouldn't say that you know the Lord. Everything that I d described is for believers only. God has given spiritual gifts to his kids, but he's invited everyone to be a child of his. The hope that we have, it can be the hope that you have. Paul wrote in Romans 10 that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. That's the message of the gospel. It's not what we've done, but what he's done for our salvation. I was counseling a, a person in our fellowship just yesterday, and they were worried that if uh, they celebrated Halloween or Christmas that they may not get to go to heaven. And I was like, look, you don't get to go to heaven by not celebrating or celebrating certain holidays. You get to heaven because of the work that Jesus did. All of the work for all of our salvation is all done because he did it. And you can be forgiven of your sins. The guy who's writing this letter to Paul, he was killing Christians before he was planting churches. That's what he was doing. God is not limited by our past, by our present. If our future is in his hands, we have hope. He wants you to be successful and fruitful in your life more than you want to be successful and fruitful in your life. If you have not surrendered your life like when I was 12, before I had that moment when I was 14, if you have not given yourself entirely to him, let today be that day. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord, which encourages us, it exhorts us. Lord, it, it's a light for us. Lord, I pray for those who are here this morning, Lord, that they would know the gift that you've given to them, or that they would think about the gift you've given to them, that they would think about you as the giver of that gift, that they would think about the time in which they first discovered that. Lord, and I would pray that as they think on these things, Lord, that they would give themselves entirely to them, that in doing so it would be clear to everyone around them that their progress would be evident uh, to those around them, that, they, that others around them would know that they have a gift from you uh, because they are able to give more than what they've got. Lord, we thank you for your love for us and giving us not only these spiritual gifts, but the gift of your Son, who died on the cross for us, Lord, whose uh, death 
covered all of our sins and whose raising to life gives us hope of eternal life. We pray that you would mold us and make us into who you want us to be today. In Jesus' name, amen.